Well, good morning. Great to see you this morning. Hey, I want to add my um, just ringing endorsement to uh, what Evan said about labor of love. Our food drive is coming up this weekend. Some of you are new enough to LifePoint that you don't know the history of our involvement there. And, and let me just give it to you in a nutshell. When we uh, started out as a church, um, we actually started in Lacey, where Aspire Middle School is now, but we were only there for about nine months. Uh, at the time, that was called Horizon Intermediate School, and they were preparing to uh, transform that into a, a Aspire, and so they kicked us out um, to do that remodel, They, uh, but they gave us the opportunity to go over to Timberline High School, and we were at Timberline for about 11 years, and uh, while we were there, at the very beginning, we just felt like uh, we ought to serve where God placed us. We didn't have a lot of resources at the time. Uh, we were a smaller church. Um, and so we just we just started asking uh, of the principal uh, in particular and others as well, how, how could we as a church serve here? And, of course, they're always worried that, that what you're all about is proselytizing kids. And uh, we said, you know, that's a, that's a good thing, but that's not what we're asking. We're asking how can we help you do better uh, what you're trying to do. And um, ultimately, that led me to sitting down across the table with a woman named Deanna East, who at the time was coordinating the program that Jennifer Gould now coordinates. And, uh, you know, a, a lot of barriers went up when that conversation and and what I discovered in that conversation is that a lot of churches will come in and, and they will they'll want to do one thing and be done. And they want to make themselves feel good because they did something and then go away. And uh, sensing that, I, I said to Deanna, you know, uh, we're a small church. We're just getting started. I don't know what all we can actually do. I can't promise you any particular statistics, but here's my here's my promise to you that we will be consistent and we will be dependable. And um, over the years, God has honored that consistency and that dependability and uh, has opened doors and expanded our influence so that today, um, not only do we fill the cabinets at Timberline High School, but all of the other high schools in, in the North Hurston School District come and get food and they fill their cabinets and so, in effect, LifePoint Church, through our food drives, are supplying the needs of uh, homeless and low-income students across the North Thurston School District. And, um, of course, now here we are. God moved us over here. We're in what is the Olympia School District. And we're going to continue to ask the question, what can we do to serve here? We don't have the full picture of that yet. Uh, COVID has slowed down a lot of things, and that's one of them. Um, but here's the deal. What I'm asking you to do is uh, to join me as the church did way back then uh, in keeping that commitment of, of consistency and, of, and dependability by uh, helping us do the food drive next weekend. And we do other things throughout the year. You know, we, we do school supplies. We do a thing in May that's called Undie Sunday uh, <laughs> because one of the needs of homeless kids, low-income kids, is underwear and socks and it's one of the things that Deanna told me they were always asking for, so we invented Undie Sunday. So there are a number of ways that we serve the program, but the the, the food drives is kind of the, the heart of that. And so would you please uh, offer up a, a couple of hours, Friday or Saturday, and, uh, and join us in that, and I'll, I'll be there too, I promise you. I always wait and uh, fill in a hole that needs to be filled, but um, please sign up before you leave today. And let us know that you'll help. Well, we've been uh, in this series now for, uh, this is the fifth Sunday in this series, uh, Living with the Benjamins. Uh, of course, we were, we were off last week for the snow. Could you believe, I was thinking yesterday about the weather, how kind of clear and warm it was, good portion of the day. I'm thinking about a week ago, and we were, we were in two feet of snow, and that, that was just amazing. But uh, here we are this week. But we've been learning in this series that when it comes to what the Bible wants to teach us about money, and this is so important that we understand the issue is not primarily about what God wants from us, but instead it's what God wants for us. Uh, God wants us uh, to be free. God wants us to have joy in our giving. 
Uh, he wants us to have peace in relationship to our finances. Uh, he wants us to have an impact on the world through the investment of our resources. And, uh, and so that, that's the perspective that, that we've tried to establish and, and just keep reiterating throughout this series. And, and if you've missed any of the messages, you can go to our website. Uh, you can listen right there or you can download the message to your own device. Um, last week, we or two weeks ago rather, we were in message number four, which we titled The Harvest Principle. And we saw in that session that God blesses us with abundance, not primarily to increase our standard of living, but instead to increase our standard of giving. And for each of us, our spiritual harvest, that is what we will allow uh, God to accomplish in us, what we will allow God to accomplish through us in the lives of others, will always be directly proportional to our investment of three things, our time, our talent, that is our abilities, our giftedness, and our treasure. And so treasure is one part of the whole picture. And I encourage you to consider this question, what kind of harvest could God produce through me if I took him at his word and, and increased the percentage of my giving? And we introduced the 90-day giving challenge that I'll be talking about again a little later. But I, I just want to say how incredibly encouraged that, that I am and the other pastors and elders of this church have been this week by the steps of faith that some of you are taking. And I, I received two completed 90-day giving challenge forms after church two weeks ago. Uh, and I want you to know that we as pastors and elders have been praying for you who have made those commitments um, that you will keep receiving from God both the will and the strength to fulfill the commitments that you have made and that he'll bless you for your obedience. When Jesus said, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also, he was expressing the powerful truth that uh, there is an intimate connection between what my heart treasures and what it pursues. And because that is true, each of us needs to come to terms with the role that our relationship with money plays in in either supporting or thwarting our growth in him, our, our hope and love and obedience. Generosity, generosity is the sleeping giant of discipleship. And I've said this before, but I used to be a little uncomfortable, a little reticent about talking about biblical principles of finance in the church because everybody squirms, right? And and, and I squirm too because um, it's a struggle. But but here's what I came to understand one time that, that unlocked this whole thing for me. And, and, it, and it was in that statement of Jesus, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And, and what I suddenly understood that changed everything for me was that my relationship with my to my money and the ways that I use my money uh, have a lot to do with my spiritual growth, with my discipleship. So where you, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also is a is a basic principle, a foundational principle of discipleship, and that's what I realized. And I've realized that until we get clear on this in our lives, we're going to struggle because it's a matter of ownership, isn't it? Is it his stuff or is it my stuff? Am I the owner or am I a steward? Well, today, uh, our title is Your Storehouse Story. And I want to begin with this, that that each time Jesus taught on money, he leveraged it for cultivating at least these three goals. One was godly living, living in ways that are honoring to God, that are reflective of, of who we are in him. And then secondly, spiritual fruitfulness of of producing a harvest for the kingdom of God through our lives. And then third, kingdom influence. That is having a a witness to the world uh, that uh, draws people into his kingdom. In God's eyes, financial stewardship will never be about a transaction. But instead, it's always, always, always about transformation. The challenge to generosity and financial stewardship is not then about fundraising, which is a really gross way to talk about this, right? It's not fundraising. It's about 
faith raising. It's about faith raising. And, and my goal and purpose in this series has been really to, to raise our entire church's level of faith and increasing obedience in the area of financial stewardship. Generosity is, is really more like a ladder than an elevator in, in the growth of your faith. It requires some efforts. So you, have to, you have to choose to do some climbing. It's not just pushing a button and going to the next level. And as you climb the ladder of financial stewardship and generosity, you will be in that process forced to walk by faith because it's going to force you into a a point of tension between what you want and what God wants for you. But the higher you climb and the more clearly you, uh, you will be able to see and experience God's provision and his purpose in your life. So let me introduce this this morning by, by asking this question. Have you ever thought of yourself as a thief? Have you ever thought of yourself as a thief? How would you respond if someone accused you of being a thief? And this morning we're concluding this series by taking a closer look at the passage of Scripture that most clearly and directly addresses the principle of tithing. And it's found in the book of the Italian prophet Malachi. Uh, otherwise known as Malachi, uh, chapter 3. It's easy to find in your Bible. It's, it's the last book in the Old Testament, right before Matthew begins the New Testament. So if you have your Bibles, uh, please go ahead and open those. Uh, Malachi is the, the last book there, and so you'll find it easily. In this book, God has been expressing his love toward the people of Israel. He's been expressing his faithfulness to every promise he has made to them. He's been reminding them of his mercy towards them and all the ways that he's watched over them and protected them and blessed them. And at the same time, he's been getting right up in their grill uh, without mincing really any words about their faithlessness, faithlessness, their rebellion, their lame approach to worship, their adultery, their apathy, and it reads like a list of indictments. It looks like list reads like a rap sheet, announcements of, of coming judgment and very practical and detailed calls to repentance. In chapter three, beginning at verse six, he addresses their relationship with money. And I'd like to ask you to stand and let's read this aloud together, as is our habit at Life Point. For I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore, you, O children of Jacob, are not consumed. From the days of your fathers, you have turned aside from my statutes and have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. But you say, how shall we return? Will a man rob God? Yet you are robbing me. But you say, how have we robbed you? In your tithes and contributions. You are cursed with a curse, for you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. Bring the full tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house, and thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need. I will rebuke the devourer for you, so that it will not destroy the fruits of your soil, and your vine in the field shall not fail to bear, says the Lord of hosts. Then all nations will call you blessed, for you will be a land of delight, says the Lord of hosts. This is God's word. You may be seated. Before we proceed, let's take a look at this video. Oh, I couldn't. Well, maybe just a bite. Oh, yeah! All right! Don't forget the interest.
dude, he brought the pie. guy chosen to play God in the video is a, a rather round older man with gray hair and mustache and a goatee. I, that was a blessing to me. Did it occur to you how gracious God was in the video even though he brought the pie and then didn't get any of it? Dude, he brought the pie. In verse 6 of Malachi 3, God defines the truth about Israel's relationship with him. For I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore, you, O children of Jacob, are not consumed. See, God says, considering the kind of people that you are, it's a good thing for you that I am who I am. I don't change. I keep my promises, I forgive your sins, I redeem your life from the pit, I restore you, I provide for you, I feed you, I clothe you, I love you, my love for you is constant and it's unchanging. But then he goes on in verse 7 and and very matter-of-factly points out that there has been a breach in their relationship. That, that the possibility of reconciliation remains, but it's their move. Return to me, he says. From the days of your fathers, you have turned aside from my statutes and have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. It's your move. It's your move. In the interchange in verses 7 to 9, they respond, but you, or God says, but you say, how shall we return? Will a man rob God? Yet you are robbing me. But you say, how have we robbed you? In your tithes and contributions. How have we robbed you? in your tithes and contributions. You are cursed with a curse, for you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. Pretty profound indictment. And in this case, to return was to stop robbing God. What was their move? It was to stop robbing God. They were robbing him by withholding their tithes and offerings. And what resulted was that they had made themselves subject to a curse. And the curse, according to verse 11, came in the form of an invasion of insects that were devouring their crops and a blight that caused their plants to drop their fruit. And in an agrarian society, the combined of the effect of the two spelt disaster. It spelt a severe loss of income. And God called them to repent and to return. You know, sometimes in our lives, we encounter unexplainable financial difficulty. And sometimes that unexplainable financial difficulty may, in fact, be the result of financial disobedience. So what to do? God's prescription is in verse 10. Bring the full tithe. Bring the full tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. The prescription, God's prescription, is to bring the full 10%. That's what tithe literally means bring the full 10% of their income into the storehouse. And don't miss this. 
do not miss this, even in a time of economic downturn, which they were in. They were in. See, the purpose that God then provides for this command is so that there may be food in my house. That is, so that they and others would have the opportunity to be fed from the storehouse. And notice that he says that the storehouse is my house. The storehouse is God's house. See, the place where God intends us to bring our tithe is the place where we are being regularly fed. And for most of us, that is the local church. I've suggested during this series that if you don't trust me or you don't trust LifePoint with your finances for some reason, then then go ahead and give it to another church or Christian ministry of your choice as an experiment of faith. But... I would never actually recommend that be your standard of practice. My belief remains that the full tithe is to be brought into the storehouse, which is, for us today, the local church. We're to bring the whole tithe to the place where we are being spiritually fed, where we're being cared for, after which, after which, we are free to give offerings to other ministries and charities. And that's the essential difference between tithes and offerings. Here in Malachi, God refers to tithes and contributions. They are not one and the same. A tithe is a matter of first fruits. It comes right off the top. An offering is over and above the tithe. So here's the essential principle. You give to God through your local church. You give to God through your local church. And now look where where he goes next. He says, bring the full tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house and thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts. (laughs) You see, nowhere else in the Bible does God invite us to put him to the test. In fact, it's written in Jesus, you might remember from Jesus' temptation in the wilderness. He said, it is written, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. You shall not put him to the test. But here God invites us. He's, he's, He's issuing an invitation, don't miss this, to put him to the test. And he's promising blessing for obedience, in contrast with failing to obey, which he says is robbing him. God said it, I didn't. This is what God says. God promises blessing for obedience in the stewardship of our money and our stuff. We don't preach a prosperity gospel here at LifePoint. We don't ever begin to claim, because the Bible never says it, that that if you're faithful in your giving, you'll be the next Jeff Bezos. And you'll always have nice hair and big white teeth that are all straight and and drive a Tesla. You know, that's not going to be you necessarily. Maybe you. Could happen. But there's no promise in that regard. Listen to the promise. Bring the full tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house, and thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need. I will rebuke the devourer for you, so that it will not destroy the fruits of your soil, and your vine in the field shall not fail to bear, says the Lord of hosts. And then all nations will call you blessed, for you will be a land of delight, says the Lord of hosts. See, God wants us to turn away from robbery and turn toward reward. Turn away from robbery 
and toward reward. And he makes three specific promises in verses 10, 11, and 12. Notice what they are. First of all, in verse 10, a promise of provision. Provision. I will open the windows of heaven for you and pour down a blessing until there is no more need. Now again, notice what he's saying. He says, uh, he's not saying I'm going to pour down a blessing for you until you've got the nicest house in the neighborhood and the most expensive car and your kids go to the most expensive schools. That, that, that's not the promise. The promise is, I will pour down a blessing until you have no more need. You, you have no more want. You have no more uh, reason for worry about your financial picture. Second promise is in verse 11, promise of restoration. I will rebuke the devourer for you so that it will not destroy the fruits of your soil and your vine in the field shall not fail to bear, says the Lord of hosts. And again, in an agrarian society, in an agrarian picture, there are, there are bugs, there are pests, there's, there's pestilence that's destroying their crops. Restoration first meant economic restoration. God says, I'm going to restore you economically. And then notice the third promise. That's a promise of influence in verse 12. Then all nations will call you blessed, for you will be a land of delight, says the Lord of hosts. And God will enable us to be influential in the lives of those around us because of and, and as a blessing for our faithfulness, our generosity. Well, this morning I've asked Bill and Deb Marchant to share what I'm going to call their storehouse story. And uh, and Bill and Deb, would you come on up? I also asked Deb to sing a vocal solo, (laughs) to which she willingly complied. Not really. Come on up. I think it's on. Yes, it is. There you go. So uh, will you just share briefly with us the the story of of how you came to a point of decision to be obedient and and, and generous in in your uh, financial and material resources? Well, the story is more of a process than an event. Um, I think we have been tithing for a number of years <clears throat> but I don't think we were meeting the 10% threshold. Not necessarily here at LifePoint, but in Alaska, where we're from. But what we discovered uh, several years ago when you did the Benjamin series, and we took the 90-day challenge, was that uh, it worked. <clears throat> and that was, to me, uh, and more recently, I've come to an awareness that when God makes a promise like that, it's, it's really an axiom. It's, it's something that when God makes a promise, he's going to keep it. And so that was, that was one of the events that took place. And also, our life group is doing the treasure principle. And I've always had this notion that, you know, because we've been taught this as believers, that this isn't ours anyway. It's all on loan, and um, we get to be stewards of it, and we can't take it with us. Hmm. And so that, that has had kind of a, a profound spiritual impact for us as well. Yeah. Has this impacted your marriage and family in any ways? Yeah. Um, you know, Jim provided us with these questions, so we've been mulling these over. And we, but I, as I mulled it I over... I didn't give her the music for her solo. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, come next November, Dev and I will have been married 50 years. And... <clears throat> Um, one of the things that, that I have been aware of with friends and, and other members of our family is that one of the, the biggest obstacles to a healthy marriage is financial problem or financial problems. <clears throat> and so fortunately, both Deb and I are the offspring of Depression-era parents. And so we had this kind of thing working for us already in that we, 
know the value of a dollar because our parents taught that to us. And so we, uh, we had not ever particularly become overextended financially. But when we connected these promises to God's word and realized that this goes much further than just worldly financial stability, there's a spiritual stability too. And so does that kind of address? For our family, um, our kids are now tithing. They learn to do that for the rest. And our oldest son is teaching his children to tithe, and they're young. And they're all, they're all giving each week their allowance and saving money back to tithe at their church, too. So that was wonderful to see. Mm. So I'm curious about how it's also maybe impacted your spiritual growth. What, what has uh, this decision um, or these decisions um, done in terms of growing closer to the Lord, growing in Him? <clears throat> I, when, when I think, you know, we're getting older, and, and I'd like to think that with age comes wisdom. And there are things that we are, that I'm learning and I, I sometimes I'll shake my head and say, why didn't I get that 30 years ago, mm-hmm. you know, when it was so obvious to me now? And um, I, I guess the thing that, that's coming around to us now is that God is faithful, and uh, he will provide us opportunities to test him, as, as um, we're reading in Malachi. Um, <clears throat> and so uh, having taken the 90-day um, challenge in the past and seeing how it worked, we, we made that decision to, in addition to our tithing as, as an additional amount, we made a dedication to the Vision Next project. And that, I ha- I'll admit, that, that, was, that caused me a little trepidation. Um, we're not going to do the 90-day challenge this time, because we've made a different decision. We've, we've, we've taken, since we've already fulfilled our, our obligation to the Vision Next uh, campaign, we simply took that amount and rolled that into our, our tithe now. And so going forward, I'm excited to see what's going to happen if we do another capital campaign and um, we have opportunity to give over and above again because it worked before. My thought is it's going to work again. Yeah. So you mentioned testing. Are there any other ways in which God has allowed these decisions to test you? And um, what's the other part of my question? How have you seen him keeping his promise uh, through all of this? I don't know if you were listening to Katie up here. I just remembered when we were in business um, one year, well, we we had to pay quarterly taxes, which is quite a bit. Then we had to pay the staff, the rent, and then, of course, we're buying our house. And then our Joe's partner decided to renovate the office. And we thought, how are we ever going to come up with all that at once? And God provided it. And I thought, man, we know he was there. We don't, we just, that's the only reason we know it was there, because he, he provided it for us, because there's no other way we could have done that. Those were times of extreme financial challenge, and, and paying an estimated quarterly tax on a small business there, there were days when we had to, Deb and I would not take an income so that we could pay our staff. But as I look back at it, <clears throat> I'm just reminded, God, like Deb said, God was faithful. And I, I'm i tying this to a story in Scripture that I love and am bothered by at the same time, and that's the story of the rich young ruler who, who came to Jesus and said, Lord, what must I do to be saved? And, and Jesus addressed him knowing where his heart was, And finally said to this rich young ruler, you know the story, sell everything you own and follow me. And when I reflect on that story, that rich young ruler's soul is alive somewhere in the universe. And he, he, he opted not to follow the Lord. And I'm sure he's looked back on that moment in time thinking, what did I do? Or what did I fail to do? I don't want to be in that position. No. Spiritually. Can either of you foresee, imagine a scenario in which you would look back and say, I wish I'd kept more for myself? No. I, 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 was, I was hoping to give a more inclusive answer to that, but the more we pondered it, the more we just, nah, no. No. 
Yeah, that's awesome. Let me pray for you. Father, thank you so much for Bill and Deb. Thank you for their the lives that they live among us, for uh, the ways that they serve you among us, the ways that they lead. And uh, Father, thank you for their model of uh, faithfulness and obedience in, in this area of, uh, of financial stewardship. And Lord, we know that they are that's just one part of the picture, that time and talent is, is also an enormous part of that picture for them. And so we give you thanks for them and ask you to continue blessing them. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Let's give them a hand. Oh, I forgot the solo. <laughs> You know, every journey is a succession of steps, right? Um, let me ask you this morning, what, what next step will you take personally on your gen, uh, journey to generosity? What's the next step that, that God might be asking you to take? What will be your storehouse story? In your program this morning is the 90-Day Giving Challenge. This is, again, just just a way that that we want to uh, encourage you to take a step uh, of, of obedience, kind of a, a risk-free uh, experiment, if you will, of, of testing God. And if at the end of, you know, you, 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 choose, the, you, you choose the percentage, whether you're going to move from... Um, you know, from zero to three or zero to five or zero to ten, whatever that percentage is, just list it there. And uh, and then you're going to be asked to compare that to what your percentage is now. Um, but I want to let you know that uh, two families last week or two weeks ago chose to accept the 90-day giving challenge. Uh, one family is increasing their giving from 1.6 to 6.6%, an increase of 5%. Um, another family is increasing their giving from 3% to 10%, which is an increase of 7 And uh, these are significant steps of faith and obedience. And uh, let's just applaud them right now for that, shall we? And I want to just pause and let's pray for them together. Lord, we, we lift them to you, uh, knowing that uh, this took some thought on their part, some prayer. Uh, and uh, Father, I just pray that that you would meet them uh, with you in your faithfulness uh, at the point of their obedience and that they would find you faithful uh, in, in all the days to come. And, uh, and so we look forward to what you will do in Jesus' name. Amen. Just a couple final things. I mentioned that, that we give to God, but we give to him through our local church. Um, It's to God. It's through the church. And there are a number of ways, I I shared these last time, a number of ways you can give here at LifePoint. You can give online at mylpclacy.com slash give. There's an offering box at the back every Sunday morning. There's also a digital giving kiosk back there through Square at the information center, and and you uh, can give there. Um, there's also a church center app that's available on the, the App Store or on Google Play. You can download that app. You can choose Life Point Church of Olympia uh, on that, and you can give that way. There's text to give uh, at 84321, and again, you're going to choose Life Point Church of Olympia. Uh, there's good old snail mail. You can mail a check to the church. I mentioned last time also there's Pony Express, and that's where you, you, you get in your Mustang or your Bronco or your old Pinto and drive to the church and hand deliver your check. And there's also ACH automated, automated withdrawal through your own bank, and you can set that up very easily. I want to suggest two more ways this week that you can give to God through LifePoint Church, and one is through stocks and bonds and real estate, that that's, that's something that we are set up to receive. And if you want to give that way, you, you certainly can give that way. And then you might also consider some of you are engaged in estate planning and setting up your will. You might think about um, LifePoint in, in that planning. Well, there's an enormous secret 
to success in giving that's prioritized, percentage, and progressive. You want to know what it is? It goes like this. Automation assists determination. Automation assists determination. You can make a choice to give, but uh, it, may, it may become difficult to actually do it. You know, your hand starts to shake, shake as you write your check or as you're trying to slip it into the slot with your credit card. Um, but here's the idea that you and God um, together decide on on a particular percentage that 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 he would have you give to him through LifePoint. You set up automated recurring payments, which, again, you can do that online or on our website, it's completely secure. You can do that through your own bank. Um, why do that? Because we know ourselves, right? We know ourselves, and so um, we know our own... Uh, weakness. We don't know our own temptations to to uh, spend our money in other ways. And so, if if you set it up and it just goes out of your account every every uh, pay period, um, that's an amount that you and God have decided on, and, and it's a done deal, and, and it just happens. I asked you this question last week. I want to pose it again this morning as we close. What could happen this year? Or, or in any of the years to come, if if everyone at LifePoint Church actually tithed, that is, that if all of us gave 10% of our income to God through LifePoint, would there be would there be more than enough food in God's house to serve our community and our world? Think that's possible? I think so. Would would we experience His provision like never before? Might God rebuke the devourer for us so that so that we would become fruitful and productive both spiritually and economically? Is it possible that God would increase our influence here in Thurston County so that our neighbors would see us and call us blessed and understand that God is among us and that it is he who has done it so that we in turn would experience an increasingly abundant harvest in helping people to find and to follow Jesus. Think all that's possible? Really? I do. And more. And I have no doubt that it is because God is faithful to his promise and he never changes. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. We can take him at his word. We can act on it in faith and obedience. It's the the most solid thing in the world. And we can stop being robbers and become receivers. What will be your storehouse story? And maybe you've never considered these things before. Are you a thief? Is it possible that you might take some steps away from robbery and toward reward? Could it be that you've been viewing the stewardship of your uh, finances as merely transactional and not as God intends as transformational as part of his curriculum in your life to make you the person he wants you to be? Is it possible that God would have you test his faithfulness to his promise by bringing the whole tithe into the storehouse or by taking the 90-day challenge and, and, and testing God, taking him at his word? What is that thing that God wants to do in you and through you that becomes an occasion for you to offer up praise and thanksgiving to him for his love and his faithfulness and his generosity? What is that thing that God wants to do in you and through you that will result in you having a tangible witness to others in your life of the faithfulness of God? What will be your storehouse story as you live with the Benjamins. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this time together. Thank you for this series that we've been in. Thank you for what your word speaks to us. And Lord, may we be found faithful. May we be found obedient to the things that your word has so clearly revealed to us. May we not miss the joy of generosity in our time. May we, Lord, grow in our faith in you, our confidence in you, because we've seen you be faithful to your promises. And Lord, would you 
continue to produce a harvest through LifePoint Church of people that are finding Jesus and learning to follow him. We pray these things in his name. Amen.